Here we're told we have a hot, uh, a hot tub sitting on a deck and the homeowner wants to fill the hot tub with water from a hose, basically. Has just uh, under a two inch diameter for the hose. Uh, it's 1.9 centimeter hose. And it's a 25 foot length of an old garden hose. It's attached to an outdoor spigot or a faucet uh, located underneath the deck. And we're told some information about the hose. We're told that the internal roughness is 0.5 millimeters. And the water gauge pressure upstream of the spigot valve, so just right up here, is about 55 PSIG. This 55 PSIG is actually um, a little bit on the high side for a home. Most homes have water pressure coming into it about 50 PSI. So this home might be located close to uh, the water pumping station or close to the water tower. So it's a little bit on the high side. Of course, 25 foot length of old garden hose and that, that kind of diameter here pretty typical for, for hoses. And we're told that the elevation from the spigot, uh, from the ground to the spigot valve, that's given two feet, and the uh, free surface of the, of the hot tub here is at about um, 12 feet off the ground. And then the hose actually kind of has to go over the edge of the hot tub. So its maximum height is about um, one meter above the free surface of the hot tub. And we're also dealing with water here. We're also given some additional information about the minor losses due to the bends in the hose. We're told that they're much smaller than the minor loss due to the valve, and that would be very reasonable. The valve here would have a much bigger minor loss than any sort of bends in the hose, assuming the hose isn't kinked. And we're told that the, the spigot and valve has a minor loss coefficient of equal to two. And we're asked to determine the volumetric flow rate of, hot, of water into the hot tub. So we want to know what kind of volumetric flow rate we get in here so we can figure out maybe just how long it's going to take to fill the hot tub using your, your garden hose. So this is going to be a pipe flow problem. It'll involve the extended Bernoulli equation. So let me go ahead and apply it between two points. I'm going to apply point one here and point two here. So we'll just follow some streamline that goes all the way down, it goes like that. Now why did I choose those two points? Let me start with the outlet point first. This one's pretty straightforward because uh, we chose it because we know the pressure here is just atmospheric pressure since it's on the free surface. We know the velocity here is about equal to zero because the hot tub has a big surface area. We also know the elevation. So that's, those are easy, uh, you know, we know all those things, so that's an easy choice. Point two, I put just upstream of the spigot and valve here. And the reason I did that one is because that's where we know the pressure. The pressure there is 55 PSIG. So we, we know the pressure at that location. And that's why I chose that, that one. And by the way, the upstream of this spigot valve, there would be a pipe, right? The, the water is supplied by a pipe that comes out of the house. So we'll assume that the, you know, the water, there's a pipe here that's at that, the water in the pipe is at that pressure. Okay, so let's go ahead and write down our extended Bernoulli equation. And then we'll write down what we know in that equation. So there's the total head at location two. Now we'll have the total head at location one. I'm just not, the three dots just means I'm repeating what's written here just so I don't have to write it twice. We have our total head loss between points one and two and then our total shaft head between points one and two. Now let's go ahead and write down what we know. The pressure at one in terms of gauge pressure is going to be the given 55 PSIG. So I'll do it all in terms of metric units. So that'll be 379 kilopascals gauge. Pressure at two, in terms of gauge pressure, will just be zero because it's atmospheric pressure right here. So we don't have to put anything in other than just zero here because it's gauge. Okay, let's write down the velocities. So the velocity at one will be um, just the velocity in the hose. I'll just write it as V bar. Okay, I'm assuming that the diameter here at one is the same as the diameter at the hose. So that's an assumption I'm making is that the, the diameter in the water pipe in the house is equal to the diameter of the hose. And that's probably pretty close to being true. Uh, if it wasn't true, I would need to know the diameter of the pipe here. Okay, but typically it's, they're gonna be pretty close to being the same diameters. And the velocity at two is going to be about equal to zero because it's the free surface of this large uh, hot tub. 
So I'm going to call the velocity at 1. I'm just going to call it v bar just for simplicity. That way I don't have to put down a, a subscript or anything on that. Okay, let's go ahead and write down the, the z values. So I'll just write this as a difference. z2 minus z1 is going to be the 3.05 meters. It's just the difference in height from here and here. So that's just the 3.05 meters. All right, let's go ahead and continue. We have the shaft head term between 1 and 2. That's going to be 0 because there is no pump anywhere between points 1 and point 2. There is no pump in here. There's no turbine, uh, no compressor, no fan, nothing like that. So that's just 0. There's no ro rotating machinery. So there's that term is 0. And then we have our head loss between 1 and 2. And here we have a, a, a number of things that we need to include. First of all, we'll have a major head loss. So that major loss coefficient will be the friction factor times L over D. Now the L over D we know because, let me shrink this down a little bit, we're told that the, the length of the, the garden hose is about 25 feet or 7.62 meters. So we know the L, we know the diameter that's given as well. It's the 1.91 centimeters. The friction factor we don't yet know. We're going to have to evaluate that in a moment. And the velocity head where that loss is occurring is just going to be the velocity in the pipe, which I've called V bar. So it's V bar squared over 2G. Then we also have our valve, you know, the, the spigot and valve combination loss coefficient. And we're given that. That's, that loss coefficient is equal to 2. So let me just write this as K valve. And that velocity head term will be V bar squared over 2G in that case. Um, we'll also have some pipe bends, right? So some some bends in the, the hose. So, you know, we could potentially put that in there. Let me just write it in for the time being. And then lastly, we'll have an exit loss occurring right here because the flow comes out of the pipe and then eventually comes to rest inside the hot tub. So there's going to be an exit loss here. You're taking all that kinetic energy of the fluid as it comes out of the the exit of the hose, and it's being dissipated ultimately. And so that's why we have an exit loss. And that velocity head term will be V bar squared over 2. Now we're told, actually, in the problem statement that the minor losses due to the bends in the hose are much smaller than the minor loss due to the valve. So that means this term can be neglected. We're just told it's pretty small. We're told the loss coefficient for this valve is 2, so let me write that in. And then the exit loss will be equal to 1. Uh, the exit loss coefficient is always equal to 1. If you don't remember that, you can look it up in the formula sheet. This one we're not going to neglect because, you know, 1 is just, you know, half of 2 here. It's, it's a significant uh, portion of this, this valve coefficient. So we need to keep that exit loss in there because it's kind of big. So we need to keep it in there. Okay, so things are looking pretty good so far. Um, ultimately, we're trying to find the volumetric flow rate, so what we want to find in the end is what the Q value is. This is the volumetric flow rate. That'll just be the velocity in the pipe times the area of the pipe, which will be d squared over 4, where the diameter is given as the 1.91 centimeters. The problem is, is we don't know the V bar, right? The V bar up here is a question mark. We don't know what it is. So that's what we're trying to solve for initially, and then once we have that, we can find the volumetric flow rate. Now, we can't just simply plug it into the extended Bernoulli equation and solve for v-bar, and the reason for that is because the friction factor is a function of v-bar. Remember that the friction factor is going to be a function, in general, of the Reynolds number and the relative roughness, right? Where the Reynolds number is a function of the pipe, uh, the velocity in the pipe, right? You see that very clearly here. So it's this, it, you can't just rearrange that e equation and just solve for V-bar. It's just too complicated because the V-bar is also buried inside this friction factor in a complicated way. So how would we solve this problem since that's the case? Now, one way we can approach it, and uh, this is what we're going to do here, is we're going to just 
assume for the moment that we're dealing with a fully turbulent flow or a wholly turbulent flow in this hose. Now, if you remember when we looked at the Moody plot, in fact, let me go back to the Moody plot and just show you what I'm talking about here. So in this Moody plot diagram, this comes from the formula sheet, you'll see that once we get to a large enough Reynolds number, so the Reynolds number is down here, you have this dashed line, and this is called a fully rough zone or wholly turbulent zone or fully turbulent zone. Out in this region, you can see that the friction factors are pretty insensitive to the Reynolds number. They're really only sensitive to the relative roughness. You can see, you know, if we had a relative roughness of 0 0.01, let's say, for a wide range of values, the friction factor is pretty much constant. It's, not, it's independent of the Reynolds number up until this dashed line. And then in here, you start to see some dependence on the Reynolds number. But if the Reynolds number is large enough, then we can be in this fully rough zone. And then the friction factor is no longer a function of the velocity. So probably the easiest thing to do, we'll go back to the problem statement. Probably the easiest thing to do to start with would be to assume that we're in that fully turbulent zone. So let's, let's make that assumption and see where it gets us. We'll have to verify that the assumption is a good one, but let's just assume it. So assume uh, the flow is, helps if I can write properly, fully turbulent or wholly turbulent or fully, in the fully rough zone. So in that case, what that means is that the friction factor is only a function of the relative roughness. It's no longer a function of the Reynolds number. So that means we have to calculate what the, the relative roughness is. Now we're told that the roughness of this hose is 0.5 millimeters. So we can plug that in down here. So this is 0.5 millimeters. And we're told that the diameter of the pipe is 1.91 centimeters. So that'd be what, 19.1 millimeters. And so the relative roughness comes out to be 2.62 times 10 to the minus two when we do that. So let's go back to our Moody plot and look up the friction factor for that. So remember 2.62 times 10 to the minus two. Okay, so here we are, 2.62 times 10 to the minus 2. So here's 2 times 10 to the minus 2. So 2.62 might be somewhere right about in here. Okay, so I'm just kind of ballparking it. So if I just come straight across, we get a friction factor. And when I did this previously, I, I got a friction factor. I called it point, uh, 0 0.054. So that's the value I'm going to use. It. I didn't draw my line very very well here, but I got 0 0.054 when I did it a little more carefully before. So 0 0.054. Let's go back to our problem. So we'll get from the Moody plot, friction factors 0 0.054. By the way, this, this Moody plot value, you know, these are very ballpark kinds of estimates. Don't be too concerned if, if you got 0 0.054 and your friend got 0 0.052, you know, they're, they're ballpark values. Okay, so now that we know that, we can go back to our extended Bernoulli equation. And the only thing that is unknown in that equation now is just the velocity, V bar. Everything else is known. So we know, we know uh, the friction factor now, uh, we have everything else. So we can go ahead and solve for the V bar. And I'm not going to go through the algebra for that. It's, it's straightforward, tedious, but you can work it all out. And what you'll get ultimately is V bar comes out to be, um, let's see, what does it come out to be? Let me, oh, here it is. I, I, I worked it on a piece of paper and I'm looking uh, for it. So it came out to be 5.4 meters per second when I work that out. And if I use that, what I'll get for Q, it'll come out to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus three cubic meters per second for the volumetric flow rate. That's ultimately what we were trying to find. Now, I made an assumption here 
that the flow was in the fully, fully turbulent zone. So I'd just better check to see whether that assumption was a good one or not. If I, uh, in order to check that, what I need to do is check the Reynolds number. So I can go ahead and calculate the Reynolds number using that velocity I just found, and then the diameter of the hose and the kinematic viscosity of water. And when you plug in these numbers, this comes out to be about 100,000. Okay, so let's just go back and double check that that puts us in that fully turbulent zone. So back to the Moody plot. Sorry you have to go back and forth on this. It's just the way the program works. So we said the Reynolds number was about 100,000, so that puts us right about here. And if you look, ah, yes indeed, that actually puts us in the fully rough zone. So our assumption was a good one. So we don't need to go back and rework the problem in any way. We, we actually had a, a good assumption. Everything is consistent. So let me go back and make a note of that. So we'll just say the fully turbulent assumption uh, was a good one. Okay, so everything was consistent. By the way, one other thing I, I, I suppose I neglected to mention, in this equation when we were solving it, I didn't say anything about the kinetic energy correction factor um, at actually location one, because that's the, the, it doesn't matter for location two because the velocity there is zero, but for location one, I need the kinetic energy correction factor. Um, when I was assuming that the flow is fully turbulent, that also makes the kind of secondary assumption that alpha one was equal to one because it's it would be a turbulent flow, so that, that kinetic energy correction factor would be equal to one. And of course, since it is fully turbulent, that assumption's okay. Now you might ask yourself, what if what if this did not put us in the fully turbulent zone? What would we do in that case? Well, then things get a little more complicated. We actually have to do some iteration. So in that case, what we would do is we would have to would have to iterate through the problem. And there's different there are different ways to do the iterative approaches. And I actually work those out in different examples. So I'm not going to go through the whole procedure here. But one way that you might do it is you might uh, guess a value, for example, let me, let me uh, I'm thinking through this as I go through it. You might guess a value, for example, for the velocity V bar and solve this equation for the friction factor. So you get the friction factor from the extended Bernoulli equation by guessing the value for V bar. If you guess the value for V bar, then of course you can calculate the Reynolds number and you could use the Moody plot to get F. So you calculate F that way. And then uh, you could also get the friction factor. I'm sorry, I, let me take that back. You would guess a value for V bar. You would solve the extended Bernoulli equation for the friction factor. So that would be one way to get the friction factor. The other way you would get the friction factor is to use the Moody plot. So the second way you'd get the friction factor is you'd solve for the Reynolds number because we know we guessed our value for V bar. You know your relative roughness, so you could get that friction factor here. And you would compare the friction factor from this approach to the fr friction factor from this approach. If they match, then everything is consistent and everything works out. You're done. If they don't match, that, that, that means your, your guess for V bar was a good one because everything's consistent. If they don't match, then you would need to choose a different value for v-bar. And uh, I guess the uh, iterative approach I just described here um, wouldn't really give you insight into what new value for v-bar to choose, um, but you could just guess a different value for v-bar and look at which direction uh, it, it puts the f's. You, you want the f's to gradually get closer to one another, so you'd choose v-bars that get, get them gradually closer until they finally match. That's just one iterative scheme. There, there are other iterative schemes you could use that um, are maybe a little more direct. But again, you can do that in a separate, I'll show that in a separate example. I won't show that here. My point being is, I think a good way to approach these problems is to first assume that the flow is fully turbulent because that's the easiest thing to do. You don't have to do any iteration. If that works out, great, you're done with the problem. If it doesn't work out, then you have to go to the iterative approach. And there's no unique 
iteration scheme. You know, you can come up with any kind of iteration scheme, but eventually you iterate until everything in the problem is consistent. Okay, so that's what you would do if it wasn't fully turbulent. Okay, I think I've said enough about this problem, so we'll go ahead and end it there.